I think a few people are still coming in. Sarah, you let us know when you want us to get started. I'm just going to continue sipping. I feel like that's the right thing to do. Right. Are you doing the Spring Angel or the La Galo? I'm doing the Gruet first. Oh. And I have all three lined up and ready for tasting. <laughs> My La Galo looks a little we have all three? darker pink than yours. Yeah. Here's my La Galope. Yeah, it's the same. It's my more, it's more concentrated one because it's made from thicker skinned oh. grapes. So I love it. Such a good choice. It's delicious. This yeah. is our best selling rose, and it is a, it's under uh, $10. It's like a really good price point. George went to the store and got all three, so I feel like we should yeah. close our eyes, mix them all up. <laughs> I do want to say the uh, Ukrainian village Mar uh, Mariano's have. All, all the, uh, all three in a refrigerated session. Oh. I didn't have to cool it. They're easy to find. They're very, very uh, convenient. That's so brilliant. Nice job. And then we have some cocktails you can pour it into if you're not going to drink all of them by themselves. <laughs> we'll just be happy today. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. Oh, so a lot, these can all be found in the refrigerated section. That's brilliant. That is. And yeah, you just grab it, get home and open it. Yeah, perfect. I'm so happy to get my um my delivery in this bag. So cute. Oh, explore the world in a bottle. So nice. You guys always have the best bags for everything. We try really I love hard. The designer bags. I love the little square rectangular totes. Yes, Those and I love getting you like all the designer artist bags that we have whenever we drop stuff off to you. So. Yeah, I mean, because I, I don't need a Birkin. All I want is the newest Marie-Claude's. <laughs> <laughs> hey, like, oh. like, like a Louis Vuitton pattern on one. I'll, I'll, I'll show you which one. But. Ooh, All right, I think we're going to get started. Sarah's going to go ahead and meet everyone. Um, I know I've been chatting, and um, in case anyone doesn't know what day it is, it's Wine Wednesday, so we're thrilled to be here with Belinda Chang. And I'm Amanda. I work for Mariano's. Um, I'm part of the team. And Sarah here is my co-pilot, who does an amazing job. She's going to help moderate today. Um, but just to let you know why we started this, so um, and especially seeing Mayor Lightfoot today, but... During this crucial time where we're sheltering in place and social distancing, we still thought it was important to get together virtually. Um, so we started this online platform where we have cooking lessons, wine classes with Belinda, um, mixology les lessons. We have um, live music on Friday nights. And then on Saturdays, we also have kids entertainment with Miss Jamie. So we're really trying to bring a really good variety of um, events to you because even though we have to uh, be socially distant, we still can quarantine. Um, and we love Wine Wednesday with Belinda and Belinda is um, a renowned all over the world, has been everywhere. Uh, she travels everywhere. She knows everything about wine. I always ask her uh, my questions, but she's an award-winning um, a sommelier. She's an excellent event planner. She does so many great things. Um, and I'll let her tell uh, all of you about herself. Um, but just a few reminders, you must be 21 and over. Um, there's a chat button in the middle of the screen um, where you can send us any note you like. We're happy to answer questions. Um, in addition, um, there's a video monitor, uh, video icon to the bottom left. We are going to be recording tonight. So if you don't want us to post uh, your image or any of your questions, I would definitely hit uh, to turn off your video. Um, and please be kind in all the comments. This is a positive place. We won't tolerate any negativity or, or negative comments. Um, and without any further ado, we have a new joiner. Hi, Carolyn. How are you? Good to see you. <laughs> uh, we're going to get started with Belinda. Rosé all day until we froze. So George and I are drinking an amazing sparkling wine. And here's what's really fun. So I have three rosés here and some have bubbles and some don't and the colors are so different. So I thought it'd be fun that we go through sort of how rosé gets its color and how these different styles are made. You know, Amanda, to your point about how fun these are and how they're just sort of a great thing to do since we're stuck at home, you and I have done a lot of these kinds of segments on television and or in big tents in places like South Beach and Aspen. And I love these most because we get to kind of look you eye to eye and you get to 
to sort of ask your questions live and all that kind of thing. So I hope everyone's enjoying these virtual experiences and I'm super grateful to Mariano's for letting me do one about wine. I mean, those chefs, they're fun and all, but listen, all I want to do is get my drink on. Yeah, we're you. learning a lot, which is awesome. Like we have so many <laughs> great wines at Mariano's and Belinda knows them all. So from high, high to low price points, I mean, she's got us covered. Yeah, so everything here is under $20, which I think is really great. So all of these could arguably be daily drinking wines, which I'm always looking for. I think some people have a misconception that I'm drinking, you know, Dom Carignan every single day, uh, which I would love, but is not possible with my pocketbook. So the first one that we have is Gruet, which is a really neat one. If anybody has never tried this style of wine and this producer, they're in New Mexico. And last Last week, we got to go through champagne from Moet and Chandon, and also a method champenoise that's made in California from Chandon. And this is another example of champenoise, or people from the actual real deal champagne region in France coming to another place, to the US, and coming to New Mexico and using their technology to make a wine that is made in the same way, in the traditional method or the method champenoise. So this Gruet is pretty amazing and you could definitely use it to stump a wine geek friend if you kind of you know wrap this in aluminum foil or you know put one of those wine bottle covers on it because they use all the same techniques that they do to make a real champagne so if you were with us last week this one this style of wine from Gruet, not the rosé in specific, but their non-vintage, which is a white, you know, a blanc style of champagne, is made from the traditional champagne grapes. It's made for Chardonnay. We love some Chardonnay, right, Amanda? It's my favorite, I'm not gonna lie. Love it, <laughs> and Pinot Noir, and they use the same method of growing those grapes in a cooler climate, and then making still wines, and then blending still wines together to make this beautiful thing. And trapping the bubbles inside. So this particular one, the Gruet non-vintage, NV stands for non-vintage, so the grapes can be grown uh, in many different years and the still wines are tend to be making in many different years, is made from 100% Pinot Noir grapes. So here's the, the money question when it comes to rosé. How do they get it pink, right? Is this what keeps you up at night? All yeah, sometimes. Of you? No? <laughs> Maybe just me. <laughs> so I, I dream of wine methodology and techniques, but rosé can become a rosé in two different ways. How does that wine get pink? Well, version one is you allow the juice that you get after either pressing the grapes or allowing the gravity to press the grapes gently and extract some juice to stay in contact with the grape skins, right? If you've ever cut open a grape, which everyone probably has, or bitten into a grape, whether it's a green grape or a purple grape or a red grape, whatever the color of the skin, the inside is white. So that the way you get the juice a little colored or pink is by allowing the skin to stay in contact with the juice for a little bit. So that's called the maceration method. So if you want to freak out the person in the wine store or in the, the, you know, the snotty sommelier when we get back to restaurants again, which I can't wait for, you can ask them, is that a maceration method, Rosé? And they'll be like, ooh. And then they'll run back to the cellar and maybe Google the answer and give you the answer to that. But that is one way to make a pink wine, right? You take the white juice and you allow it to stay in contact with the skins of the grapes and macerate a bit until you get the color that you want, right? The longer that you allow the skins to stay in contact with the juice, like in this case with the galop, which is quite dark and quite extracted, the more color you're gonna get and the darker a rosé you're gonna get. So there's a second way to do it, which is a little easier. You make your wine, you remove the skins, and then you make a white wine and you also make a red wine and then you pour a little bit of that red wine in until the wine is pink. So that is considered to be sort of the easier way, the way to do it a little more consistently because if you get to control how much red wine you're pouring into the white wine, you can get the exact color that you want. So the, I like to call the P-I-T-A, the pain in the 
fast way to make rosé is to do that skin contact method because you don't know exactly how much time it's going to take and that how the process is going to go and you're not going to get the exact same color every single time. So of course there's a beautiful name for that method in French. They call it the saigne method of making rosé and that's also known as bleeding. So it's, a, it's bleeding in English but in French it sounds lovely. Senye. And then in Italian, they call it Solasso. So if you're ever speaking to a sommelier or reading about wine and you say, uh, you know, do you have any Senye style rosés? Or in Italy, when you're at a cafe in, you know, Verona, you can say, oh, is there, this is Solasso style rosé. You'll be referring to the original way to make rosé, and that's by bleeding the color from the skin. So that's a really kind of techie sort of geeky thing about rosé that's a lot of fun. But this Grue, to get back to that, I think is an excellent style where they do a blend of both bleeding the senye and also adding a little bit of red wine to make it pink. Oh. And I think because it's Pinot Noir, it has, you know, really pretty fruits. Like I'm channeling these strawberries and raspberries that I have that we're going to use later to make our slushy drinks. And George, I don't know if you're getting them, but you know, they also age this for two years on the yeast cells. So if you put your nose in and you're like, oh, smells just like a patisserie or like my favorite bakery. Maybe you love Vani or uh, Floriol or some of the great bakeries, Las Larson that we have in town. You might get some sort of yeasty aromas. And so, you know, when the French talk about those in wine, they talk about the notes of patisserie or brioche. So you might find those notes in a really well-made method champenoise. That's sort of what's different. One of the differences between a method champenoise made from Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and a Prosecco. Prosecco is made from the Galera grapes, you get a different set of flavors and aromas. And with Prosecco, they don't do this aging on the yeast cells in the individual bottles. So you tend to get kind of fresher, brighter aromas and flavors. And usually if I nod, people start to nod back, right? Am I right? Well, it's, it's, you know, when I, whenever I drink like boob or um, uh, wines that I know are Method Champenoise, I do get yeah. that yeasty flavor, that bready. And brioche is a perfect way to describe it because it's almost like a little yeah. buttery too, like buttery. Croissants or just like the bakery and those kind of fun spices all are found in the nose of a wine that's made in the Champagne Method for many reasons, the yeast contact and also the length of time that it gets to age and mature and get to be a little more complex. So when someone says, oh, that wine, like so complex, you know, they're not just blowing smoke. They're actually hopefully talking about all the technique and work and time that went into aging the wine and releasing it to us, but it has a lot more to offer both on the nose and on the palate. So that's our fun sparkling rosé. And of course, rosé sparkling comes from all over the world. This is a fun one for daily drinking. I've always loved this wine for years. And I also find it in a lot of hotel mini bars, which is a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know, but I always open that little half bottle of Grue when I see it in a hotel mini bar. I love it. Um, but you know, of course they make Rosé sparkling in Spain, they make Rosé Cava, they make Rosé Francia Corta in Italy, and Rosé style method champenoise and sparkling wines are made all over the world. And they're very food friendly, so I think that's really fun. So I've been sipping on this for a little bit and I'm ready to move on to one of the still. So I thought the next one we should taste together, if you have it, is the La Galope. So La Galope is an interesting one and it's the darkest color that we have of the three that I have on the list today. This one's really interesting because a lot of people drink rosés from the south of France, from Provence, right? Provence is sort of the region that built rosé life and they were the ones that have been doing rosé all day since long before, it was really cool. But this region, Gascony, is a little to the west of Provence and it's a region that is super famous for its cuisine. So if you've ever had French duck dishes or foie gras or persillade, which is a parsley sauce with garlic, kind of like chimichurri, um, but a little less on the acidic side. They put it as a condiment onto fish and meats and just about everything. That's all the cuisine of Gascony. And in Gascony, they also have Armagnac, which is one of my favorites. I mean, I'm Henny for life, 
Like I love me some cognac, but Armagnac is kind of the lesser known sister of cognac, whereas cognac is distilled two times. So you make a different kind of flavor profile and, and product. Armagnac is only distilled one. So it's considered sort of the cognac-esque spirit or the brandy for those that are a little edgier and unrefined. So I love me some Armagnac at the end of the meals of Digestif. But anyway, this Gascony region also makes some delicious wines. And so this one is quite dark, as we mentioned. And the reason why is because the grapes that they use to make this one, unlike Pinot Noir, which is quite thin skinned, are thicker skinned, right? Has anyone ever had a Cabernet Sauvignon and thought it had quite a bit of tannin or a Sanso or a Syrah or a Vermentino? <laughs> that's a white wine grape. So that's pretty unusual, but they do grow some in Gascony and they do use it in this wine. So this galope is, I think, a really interesting example of what you can do with thicker skin grapes. You can still make something that's kind of juicy and fresh and bright. Does anyone have it in the glass besides myself? And I do. Amanda has it too. I mean, we should take a sip together. Oh, yeah. Mmm. Yeah. So this one also has some sort of green herbal flavors to me. So there's Tanat, which is a really thick skin grape included in this blend. And this is the one that I can totally see with a meat dish with that Perciade parsley sauce because it has kind of a natural green component. There's also Cabernet Franc in this blend, which always has a lot of green. So if you're having kind of troubles with a dish, you're like, oh, I want to do a red wine, but I don't know what to do. It has a lot of green flavors, the dish. Something with a bit of Cabernet Franc is always a really great match. So this one on the palate also has a little more tannin. It's like a little more serious. It's a rosé you could definitely do with meat dishes and herbal meat dishes, which is pretty rare because most of the time we want to drink our rosés with kind of lighter, brighter things. So this one is a much darker counterpart to what we have going on in the Gruet. And this last one that we have to taste together, I think is one that many people have seen. Um, there was a shortage of this particular wine, Whispering Angel in the Hamptons, a couple years ago, and people, people had to book their therapists and were freaking out. So people say that Whispering Angel, this particular winery and producer, was the one that several years ago when all the American rosé wine, still dry rosé wine consumption just went off the charts. I've read statistics that say we, Americans, and I'm proud of this, drink up to 50% of the production of Provence's rosé wines. So wow. listen, I'm like a loud and proud Provencal rosé lover, and I will continue to drink it as many days of the year as I possibly can. So this is from a chateau owner in Bordeaux. Uh, his last name is Prior Lichine. They own Chateau Prior Lichine and Chateau Declan, and they invented this style of Provencal Rosé, and we all love to drink it. The first time I drank it was actually in the Caribbean. I was working as a wine gal on a cruise ship and got off, put my feet into the white sands, and ordered a uh, pretty overpriced bottle of rosé, and it was this. <laughs> so I'm pretty pleased to see that you could buy it here at a price at Mariano's where you could drink it every day and not feel pretty terrible about yourself. So this one has a much lighter color. I don't know if you can see, but it's using thinner skin grapes in general, like Grenache, and it is a really bright, fruity style that reminds you of all of the red fruits and berries. And it's no wonder that it's just really super quaffable. I mean, it was like I had to tie my hands behind my back today to not finish the whole bottle before all of you came on screen. <laughs> so it's no wonder that this is one of the most popular rosés there are in the world today. So you'll see people drinking these on patios in the spring, which I hope we'll get to do together soon but also all over the world. Everywhere there's a beach and a resort, there's Whispering Angel, and they make it in 750, which is standard size bottle, and in three liters, and in double magnums. I've seen six liter bottles of Whispering Angel Rosé, which, I mean, I'm sorry to admit, I might be able to kill myself in the course of a day or two. So it's really kind of the drink of Saint-Tropez life, they like to say, and also just outside life and 
patio quaffing and all that kind of stuff. So another style, and this is definitely considered sort of the most traditional style of dry rosé wine. I mean, there are those of us who remember Sutter Home White Zinfandel as their first rosé. Anyone want to admit it? <laughs> I think I was drinking Bartles and James. Did they even make a rosé? I'm not sure. <laughs> Probably. I mean, I remember Boone's Farm Strawberry Fields. There was a bottle of something crazy called Lancers in my parents' fridge on the top yep. shelf for quite a long time. So a lot of us have been drinking rosé for a long time, but I like to think that our tastes are a little more sophisticated now. So we've turned away from sort of those sweeter styles and certainly all of these styles that we have here are dry styles of rosé that are pretty fantastic. So which, Belinda, which is the sweetest out of those three? Uh, Tanya Kay wanted to know. I would say that the Whispering Angel is actually kind of the fruitiest because you get a lot of those sort of berry aromas on the nose, but it doesn't have a high level of what we call RS or residual sugar. So, you know, you can actually measure sugar, but sometimes your brain, when you smell fruity aromas, tells you that something's going to be a little sweet, even if it doesn't actually have some sugar in it. So all of these are absolutely dry but there are a few, I'd say the Garoue and the Whispering Angel have a little more fruit on the nose. So I was totally wrong. I, I wrote, she asked, and I said, I think it's La Galopa. Let's check. Oh, it. I think the Galope to me has like some density and some glycerin. So right. even though they're all dry styles, to me, this one drinks the driest, i.e., you know, when you like, if you ever suck on a lemon. <laughs> Sometimes. sometimes. I do that sometimes. So, you know, when it like really evaporates all the saliva in your mouth, you know, that's sort of a hallmark of dryness, if you will. So, but all of these are dry and all of these are really fun. But we're about to turn them from dry into not so dry and from respectable 12 point something percent alcohol beverages into something that's a little higher for crushing if you have a terrace or you have a patio or you want to go drink outside. So a couple months ago, it was a couple months ago, Amanda, we put together a really fun video about- Oh yes, yes. In drinks. <laughs> so I love to make anything in a blender, right? Like there is not a slushy that I will not love. And I don't mind throwing in some Grand Marnier or Chambord or Cointreau into anything frozen. Cause as much as I do love the blue raspberry icy from 7-Eleven, <laughs> I've also grown up <laughs> from there. So we thought it'd be really fun to put together a video on frozen pink drinks. So that's sort of the inspiration for what we're doing with you today because a lot of people really love that pink drink recipe. Yeah, this is a great recipe. So I think Sarah's gonna go ahead and, and play the video. Okay. I'm ready for that now. So. Then I'm gonna run to my freezer and go get my frozen wine ice cubes. Okay. <laughs> Might have to too. Oh, here we go with Sarah. So we have a YouTube channel uh, where we have a lot of actually really cool videos if anyone's looking for recipe ideas. But this was a funny little vignette we did with uh, Todd Stein, who's one of our tastemakers as well. Um, and we had a rosé hotline set up last summer and it was really fun. People actually did ask us a lot of questions, so it was great. We used uh, Chloe for this one. But you can see Belinda. For this recipe, she used peaches. Um, I love the idea of freezing the rosé in advance in the ice cube tray because it does keep it obviously like, it, I will say like there's so many complicated recipes for rosé and Belinda's is the easiest one, which I really appreciate. Thank you. I think the other thing is a lot of the rosé recipes add simple syrup, which is basically sugar and water. And I know a lot of us are trying to reduce the amount of sugar that we include in our diet. So I prefer to get my sugar the natural way from liqueurs and booze. <laughs> so there is no simple syrup and no added sugar in this. There is only sugar from fruit, which is partially fermented. And this recipe is really easy. And as Amanda said, a little different from everyone else's. So everything is in equal parts. So we're going to use one part 
frozen wine cubes, so about a cup of them. So if you have these like silicon molds, these are really great, or just your regular ice cube trays will work. You want to ensure success with the freezing of the cube, so it's best to use lower alcohol wines. So you wanna maybe check the back of the label because there are rosés that are 12 and 13% alcohol, so those will be a little harder to freeze, but there are also rosés that are a little lower you know, 11, 10, and 9%, and they have a higher water content, so they'll freeze a little six, more successfully. So it's gonna be one part wine cubes, one part a liqueur of your choice. So I don't know what you have at your bar, but I've got some Cointreau, and I've got some Grand Marnier, and we're gonna use Grand Marnier for the first one. And then one part frozen fruit. So in the recipe, we used um, grapefruit juice the first time, and frozen peaches, Oh, these are not so frozen, but it's gonna work out okay. And we also used a little lemon juice and we used a Pellegrino soda. So you can pretty much use anything that you want. You just wanna get it as cold as possible and as frozen as possible. So I also had all the liqueurs um, in the freezer and then all the fruit is in the freezer too. So this is one of those, it's a kitchen cocktail because you can use anything that you have and it's gonna make something delicious. I used to get into fights with bartenders that I worked with because I would argue that wine is a little harder than cocktails because with cocktails, if they don't taste great, you can just add something and make it taste better. And you can use generally pretty much anything that is in your refrigerator, freezer, or pantry. Okay, so these are the frozen juice cubes. And then I also added the frozen wine cubes, one part, one part, one part. And then I'm gonna add one part of the liqueur. So this is how we're getting a little bit of sweetness. So I'm using Grand Marnier for this one. And I also realized this morning that I lost the top to my blender. So I'm gonna to remember to cover it with something. Oh, is that a little more than one part? That should be okay. <laughs> and I'm gonna add some fruit. So I have frozen berries of all sorts. I think for this one, I'm gonna use frozen raspberries. Um, just to add some texture and some fruit and some really pretty color. And I'm going to remember to cover this sucker and then we're going to blend. That's it. It's frozen-ish. If you'd like it to be a little more frozen, you can certainly put that little concoction into the freezer and let it freeze a little bit, maybe scrape it a little bit like you would a granita. But this cocktail smells so good and it's so easy. And I love to garnish with any kind of herb that is handy. So I've got some rosemary and some sage and also some mint. Hey, Belinda, I'm showing off. Look how nice this came out. Hey, too. Let's see, let's see. I'm gonna go put it in a glass. But it oh looks my God, good, it's so cute. I'm putting sage in mine. So so a lot of people put mint as sort of the go-to, but I love when you put a really aromatic herb because when you go in to taste the cocktail, you also get kind of a whiff of the herb, so it adds sort of a layer of complexity. You can also put some fruits. I've got all kinds of fun stuff. I mean, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, just sort of empty my refrigerator with all the weird stuff that I ordered on Instacart from Mariano's. I have a little dragon fruit, but anything will, anything will work. I mean, it's kind of amazing. It's really delicious. This is a much boozier version than most of the <laughs> rosés that are out there. People will typically do, you know, five parts wine, one part of the liqueur, and a little bit of fruit. But I love it when it's just sort of more savory and a little more boozy. Did you put Grand Marnier into yours, Amanda? What was I your did, friend? and I, I stole this straw from Belinda's house <laughs> oh, a long yeah. time ago when we were allowed to hang out, but you can't see my glass, let me go get the other one. I had these made for a party. If anybody wants a set of logo metal straws that say I got changed in them, just DM me your address, I'll send them to you. But I, you? I am so psyched about my frozen. Mine's a little darker than yours, but I think all versions are really good. I think mine looks dark because I put, um, I had frozen blackberries, strawberries, I use lemon right. juice, I did not put um, simple syrup in, but I wanted to. I had it out there, but I didn't do it. And then, but the Grand Marnier is like, yeah, I can taste it. Yeah. So 
I also have at my bar Chambord. So you could do one part wine, one part Chambord, one part fruit, one part juice. And I love to do these with grapefruit juice. You can get, Mariano's always has the fresh squeezed lemon and lime juice that you can order to make it easy so that you don't have to sit there all day. Although someone did give me one of these. So maybe they were telling me to get a little more <laughs> squeezing action on. You can use pretty much anything in those proportions. And I think you'll have a really nice drink and a really good patio quaff. Should I make one more, Amanda? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. I mean, I got nothing to do, so. I mean, I have three blenders ready and Ed and I were talking about whether we thought a stick blender would work and I'm not sure um, that it would work, but maybe. Okay. It might, it might actually work if, but I think for that you need to have more like liquid in there to create a little bit more like make the it, make a little more momentum. So this blender, I also lost a part of the top, but I have most of it. <laughs> so here we go. We you know Melinda, she's very careful with her things. So I'm very surprised to learn that you're missing. I'm missing a lot of things. I don't know. I just have a lot of kitchen gadgets and they have a lot of parts, don't they? And if you don't use them every day, you think that you should put them in storage. Anyway, so here are my juice cubes. Those are all going in. And then I have the rest of my wine cubes. And you could do this, this is a great one to use up your leftover wine too. You could just freeze everything into cubes and make slushies or freeze it into cubes to use when you're deglazing the pans. I'm all about finding ways to use wine because we don't want Actually, that's a great it. idea. So we did a, the class we did last night was yeah. with uh, Chef Lamar Moore and he was making biscuits and doing barbecue tips. And we had um, TJ from Gallo, one of our uh, wine friends on with him. And the people did ask what to do. And that's, I never thought, I mean, there is one Pinot Grigio I love to cook with actually, because I also like to drink it. Yeah. But I, um, sometimes it's left over, but to make it into ice cubes is a really good idea. It's like freezing stock or something. Okay, so I have frozen blueberries. So we're gonna make this one real purple. It's gonna wow. Be yeah. So this particular blender has a top, but it's missing the thing that goes in the top. So if anyone knows or has an extra, let me know. <laughs> so we'll give this one a little blend too. And then we have slushy number two. Oh my gosh, my bar is so little. There's nowhere to put anything, but I've got a glass ready to go somewhere here. Here it is. So there's other options here too. If you like a little more sweet, I've got a bunch of jams that were gifted to me. So you could add in a little jam. Again, anything to not add simple syrup. I don't love simple syrup in cocktails because you know, it's, it's that cane sugar. And it's funny, you'll ask bartenders to leave out simple syrup in recipes and they kind of get upset because that's not a classic way to do things. But ooh, look at my purple. Oh, that looks great. Candy. So another thing you can do, in addition to playing around with my recipe, is I love to add something bubbly always because it adds an interesting texture. So we have some of this San Pellegrino flavored mineral water, they call it, with zero calories, unsweetened. And this one is dark morello, cherry, and pomegranate. So I'm going to add a little bit of a top of my cocktail, which adds some more flavor and complexity. And who doesn't like bubbles? And then I think this one, I'm gonna do like a little rosemary and some mint. I love condiments in cocktails. I love to add everything in the kitchen sink. Oh, that looks gorgeous. I hope you're gonna take pictures of this after and send them to us. <laughs> sure. Star fruit. I have, you know, some lime. I feel like lots of condiments shows that you care. So this is version number two of a fun slushie that you can do at home. And you might have all the ingredients right now. I'm using all the leftover herbs from last week, Amanda. I love it. I mean, it's, um, I think what's really great about all these classes that we're doing too, uh, the Wine Wednesdays with Belinda and um, our other tastemakers, it's really like, you know, you're, you're out, you know, shopping for your essentials, but how do you, like we're doing a fried rice class with Bill Kim on Sunday and I know he's gonna clean out. I mean, I know he's gonna be like, you know, he actually says in the recipe, use whatever protein you have left over. So I think this is a great way, Belinda, to 
like use, you know, I had, you know, hello, I'm like breaking into the kids smoothie uh, stash of like fr frozen yeah. fruits, but we have a lot of it because they like to make it. And it's, you know, I don't have any herbs though. So I'm stuck with just my cup and your, in your straw. That's okay. I can walk over later. We can have some in. We can six feet away. I'll toss you some sprigs of rosemary. <laughs> thank you. Now I, I know you're my, our true friend, my true friend. So thank you. Cheers. So I hope everybody's inspired to make some fun slushy drinks. It's so easy. And the amazing thing about it is if you blend up what you think is going to be great and it's not as delicious as you thought, there's a million ways to kind of doctor it and get it to where you want. And with the slushy drink, if it starts to melt a little bit, like I said, you can kind of do granita style. Just pour it into maybe a pan or any kind of pot that you have that'll fit into the freezer. Pour it all in, put it into the freezer, and then kind of scrape it like a granita. And then you can serve it once it's sort of at the texture that you want. And then the last thing, which I kind of did on the sly, is in addition to adding a little bubbly character and feature to it using flavored waters, and there's so many great ones at the store. You guys have bubbly, which is my new favorite, and mm -hmm. the LaCroix and all of those. You can also do what's called royaling the drink. So there's nothing that is not better, not a day or a month or a cocktail <laughs> that doesn't get better when you add a little bit of sparkling wine. So I love to add a little bit of the Gruet to my super fun little slushy here. Oh my God, that makes it look so much more festive. Right? It also <laughs> extends it a little bit so you can keep the party going and not have to wait for the bartender to blend another one for you. And then you can keep adding the Gruet, which is not a bad thing. And it's like you get a new drink every single time, which I think is really fun. I really do love your recipe because um, I want to say it was like two summers ago, my friends and I had a rosé party. And that's why I made the cups that say yes way rosé. We still have like a bunch left. but. The frosé recipe we used was so complicated. You had to like make a syrup like two days before and like freeze that. And then it was, there were so many steps. And this I feel is like, okay, well, like you just have to freeze um, the rosé wine really. Yeah. And then everything else is like, you have frozen fruit, but it just, it's such an easier thing to throw together. Cause like I had all this stuff. It wasn't. This is something that uses up leftovers. And yeah. then I think we'll impress all of your friends when they can come to our homes again to, to have a party. You can just do batch after batch of this if you have everything set up and frozen in the freezer and very cold, you know, you'll just keep doing it. Unless, I don't know, does anyone out there have one of those slushy machines? Well, maybe let's take people off a of mute. I feel like uh, Ed has some good, Ed just said, like Ed loves, it seems like he likes the recipe and he says, I miss bartenders. I wanna know where he likes to hang out. Yeah, let's hear it. Um, so Sarah can maybe unmute everyone because I don't know how to do it. She did it. Ed okay, cool. It. Um, Ed, if you're listening, where do you like to, like, where's your favorite bars or what do you like to drink when you well, go to bars? And it's kind of funny because I consider myself a homebody, but like, I think for a good solid month after we're able to leave the house, I will not be a homebody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I drink a lot of, um, uh, we, we're a big wine house. As you can see, there's a, there's a good size wine shelf over there. Um, I also, I drink a lot of bourbon drinks usually, um, but mostly red wine and then a mix of, of white and rosé as well. You're in an awesome, it looks like a wine cellar or like, a, I can't tell what's behind you. It's either this brick is or actually, something. this is our dining room. But the cool oh. thing is, is this is the fireplace. And like on the other side is the actual fireplace and the living room. This is the dining room. Well, it was very cool. It looks like you're in, Thanks. you're sitting in your wine cellar having some. Right. Delicious. Yeah. That's our next Marilyn project, also loves so. your pork <laughs> wreath. She and I both love your wreath. Um, <laughs> Linda Brooke has a great question. She wants to know, is there a general difference between French, rosé, and Italian, broadly speaking? Yes, I, that's a great question. So the Italians do all kinds of wacky things. If you've ever had Chirisuolo, Rosé. That's my most, actual favorite wine. Next it's Friday night. like fluorescent pink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that Italy really also has the most orange tinged rosés, which I know Amanda really loves. So I, I find that the rosés from Italy are a lot more earthy and a lot less sort of fruit centric. So when we're talking about wines, we talk about primary character, more good wine geeks speak. So primary is when you put your nose in and you're like, oh, 
it has lovely primary character. It has a lot of pretty fruit notes. And then you can also say like, ah, oh, so much secondary and verging on tertiary, um, which means that you're getting kind of earthy notes or mushrooms or truffles or forest floor and all that kind of stuff, which happens with a little bit of aging and different types of soils. So I find the Italian rosés in general to be a little more secondary and tertiary and a lot more sort of earthy uh, and to have a lot of those other flavors and aromas other than fruit, um, which some people really love, some people don't. It's a style thing, but they're certainly all super food friendly as I find just about every Italian wine to be. And you can explore all kinds of weird rosé stuff. <laughs> they, they do it with just about every grape, the ones we've heard of, like Sangiovese and Cabernet Franc and the ones we've never heard of, you know? So I think it's really fun. It's a really great place to region to explore the rosés. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Well, Linda, what, um, just, you know, I know we have three, I love the, I love the wines we picked and I think we, we picked them on accident kind of that they're also different, but oh, what, like what would be, um, like a good pairing for like the, like any, I guess any rosé and is there something you'd pair more with the Whispering Angel? To right. me, Whispering Angel is something you can just drink outside all day long. Like they have it, they sell it at Gibson's, like we sell it, we actually sell the, the Magnum as well um, once the weather gets warmer. But I just, what would you pair? So I love the Whispering Angel. I mean, I always love that old adage, what grows together goes together. So, you know, Whispering Angel, you'd be drinking it in the south of France with like a niçoise salad and green beans. And it's actually fantastic with like all of these sort of fresh vegetables and, and clean sort of flavors. It really has nice acidity and it has strawberry, but not strawberry jam, like bright kind of like fraise du bois and all those kinds of aromas and flavors. So I love that with like, you know, the light lunch or the quiche or the salad lyonnaise with the frise and the poached egg and the bacon lardon, the crunchy sort of bacon croutons almost. And then I think that with the gruet, you can do things with like a little more complexity and richness. So, you know, I always like to talk about how champagne and sparkling wines are fantastic with fried foods. And now you've got me thinking of Italy and I'm salivating and I want like Frito Misto, you know, just the crunchy little fish and the crunchy crispy vegetables that are just lightly fried. Or I want you know, like sushi rolls, all the different sushi rolls and the sushi that you can grab and go from Mariano's, I think it's fantastic with the gruet, um, you know, all like cheese plates, which sounds a little weird, but like the charcuterie, the little meats and the salamis and the different kind of nutty cheeses would be fantastic with the gruet and all the snacky things. Um, you caught me earlier. This is one of my favorite snacks <laughs> and you can get it at the store. They're just like the little pepper jack cheese crisps. You were saying, Amanda, that this is like not very many Weight Watchers points. No, I do Weight Watchers for those of you who might be interested. And I know how many points wine is. So I basically plan my life around that. And um, they, don't, they don't have a lot of points. Like they're, because yeah. it's like an air fried cheese and it's, it's really delicious. It's like a chip, but maybe better for you than your typical chip. So yeah. I love Gruet and sparkling wines with all the different little snacky things, especially this rosé made from Pinot Noir. And then I do think that the Galop, the one that's from Gascony, so a little southwest in France, is great with what they eat there, which is, you know, roasted duck breast and beef stews and kind of roasted meats and things like that with these parsley sauces. So that Galop with the Cabernet Sauvignon in it and the Cabernet Franc in it, even though it's pink, has some of the richness and character of maybe a Cabernet Sauvignon, you would order a red one, a dark one from a menu. So you can definitely have it with sort of the richer things. So if you were going to drink these in order of richness and maybe on a tasting menu, or if George is cooking a three course tasting menu for his family later tonight. or <laughs> They're the laughing. They might be doing laughing. that. They probably are. And I'll be very impressed. And I want to see all the pictures. You can unmute okay. him. Let's see. Are you, what are you, are you guys cooking? Yeah. Do you have a plan for what you're going to make to eat with these beautiful rosés tonight? Uh, we have pizza. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. <laughs> well, you know what? Pizza is great. I mean, yeah. that's like a perfect uh, pairing for, I mean, what doesn't go with rosé? I mean, what doesn't pizza yeah. go with? I mean, you could drink anything. Well, I think that's what a lot of people like to say, and I think it's very true. Like, maybe why we all love rosé so much, aside from the fact that it reminds us of 
you know, gallivanting in the fields in the south of France or in St. Barts or in the Hamptons or just anywhere outside. <laughs> you know, it's also an incredibly food friendly style of wine. Whereas, you know, that big red Shiraz or that big red Malbec that you really love to drink can be challenging with a lot of different dishes and a lot of different foods. The rosés tend to kind of slip in with just about anything that you would like to eat or like to serve and just about any pizza topping that I can think of is pretty fantastic with rosé wine. So, you know, if you're going to stock your house and, you know, do a case stack of something to get through this quarantine, I think rosé is really an excellent answer and you should buy a lot of it and drink a lot of it. It is sommelier approved for sure. <laughs> when we get to next week when we're drinking other stuff with you. <laughs> Are we doing snacks next week? Yeah, next week is really going to be a lot of fun. And Belinda's honestly come up with so many fabulous ideas. Belinda, like, tell everybody about next week, because I can't wait for next week. So one of the, my favorite things to, so I think that people have a little misconception about people in my profession. I think they do think that I just walk around and chit chat and drink all day. And whereas I do do that for a percentage of my day, there are other parts of the job as well. And one of them has been, because I've written wine tasting notes for a lot of different books and magazines, is figuring out what goes best with what. So literally that means sitting in a room with a stack of recipes and a couple of chefs and eating and eating and eating and drinking and drinking and drinking until you never want to do either again to figure out what's magical together. So one of my favorite things to pair up with wines is snacks, right? Like, what is the best wine for an Asiago cheese crisp? What is the best wine for a Cool Ranch Dorito? Or what is the best wine to go along with Cheetos? I think it's a really fun game and, you know, something that's sort of a good little activity and a way to keep us busy in these times and to give us an excuse to open more than one bottle. So Amanda, maybe we should make this into a competition. Maybe I mean, I'm up for competition. We definitely are excited about next week. I think yeah. Sarah, it, or we already have the pairings, um, yeah. Keto's, pretzel crisps, and um, I think it's the wisps, isn't it yeah. the wisps? And the, yeah. yeah, I think so. But I think it'd be really fun if people want to bring their A game on the snack and wine pairing. We could award some prizes for whoever comes with the most. Yes, we can. Yeah, like bring your own pairing. Like what does go with Cool Ranch Doritos? I mean, first of all, I was when I was visiting um, Bronzeville today and I was excited about Mayor Lightfoot being there, I was eyeing like all the snacks that we have out and I was like, oh, I'm like, Fritos. Like it would be fun to make a Frito pie and then what yeah. would Frito pie go with? So yeah, let's come next week. Um, Sarah, let's like organize that somehow with everyone. Yeah. And for Chicagoans who remember um, Graham Elliott's restaurant, Graham Elliott, yes, a very famous Cheeto encrusted fish recipe that might be fun for us to find because there are a lot of sort of famous chefs that have done interesting and fun things with chips, right. <laughs> with very large production and corporate chips. So I was going to try to find that recipe because it might be fun to try to do that and figure out the wine pairing for that one too. <laughs> I love it. I mean, like, we're making it a contest. We're going to post the rules. It's basically going to be uh, Belinda selecting the winner of the best pairing. And bring can. your best chip and wine game. <laughs> I mean, that's all I want to do is eat chips so <laughs> and drink wine. It's like the perfect combination. I mean, as fun as it is to go to restaurants with tasting menus and taste lots of wines with lots of gorgeous dishes and things that are made with tweezers, I think it's also really fun to find our everyday foods and find sort of perfect wine pairings that we can enjoy all the time. So let's do Linda it. Linda has her, her like classes planned through May. And um, I do believe if they're not already posted, they will be soon. Yeah. So um, we were a little late in posting the list for Belinda today. And it was partially my fault. So I apologize, everyone. Um, I got, I, I don't know who knows what happened, but we'll be on top of it moving forward for next week. It's already posted. So you can see it. And Belinda, you do an awesome event on Sunday. Will you tell everyone about your Sunday event? Because I missed it for the first time this past uh, Sunday and I was really disappointed. Well, for the last six weeks, we've been hosting something called Virtual Boozy Brunch. Like many people out there, I'm sheltering in place as a party of one by myself. And as you can tell, I love to drink great cocktails. Oops. And I love to drink great wines as well. And this is a great way for me to do that with a lot of old and new friends. And 
a really fun part of it is we all have a lot of friends because we're restaurant lovers who are furloughed and laid off. So we bring furloughed sommeliers from all over the country and also furloughed chefs and restaurateurs whose restaurants are closed to come and take care of us. So they share their best recipes. I see a lot of faces in this room who have joined us, which is really fun. And we share the recipes about a week in advance so that you can make drinks with Julia Mamos from Bar Comico. You can make carbonara with Chef Sarah Grunberg from Monteverde and Chris Belli. She came two weeks in a row. And do things like, you know, figure out your makeup for Zoom and for all the face apps with a world-class Oscar red carpet makeup artist. So we've been doing all these really fun things and doing them together and making a Sunday a little brighter for a lot of people and also helping our friends who really need it who are in the restaurant and food and wine space by by tipping them. So <laughs> it's a really neat thing and I'm so excited and we usually see about 200 people from all over the world coming every week and we will continue to do it as long as everyone's having fun joining us for that. And maybe we'll just continue doing it all the time because I always wanted to have a chef in my kitchen with me <laughs> that I could show my dish and they could tell me if I did it right or if I need to cook it longer. That's also a really a fun aspect of it too. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think we're, you know, we're, we planned our events through May. We're booking June right now. So I think, you know, we, like we're very uh, cognizant of how important it is to shelter in place and social distance. But, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen. But we, what we do know is people are enjoying these events online. So we're going to, we're going to keep doing it. Tomorrow night we have um, a mixologist from Telemore Do, and she's going to be making uh, two pantry cocktails, both which I'm super excited about because one's actually using tea, um, which I find really interesting because a lot of people don't ever think to do that or I don't think to do that. And then, uh, you know, we all have honeys and jams and we're going to kind of work through that with her tomorrow. And then Friday night, um, we have Live at Mariano's where we feature a local musician. It's a great thing to have on while, um, you know, you're just getting your dinner ready or just unwinding at the end of the day. But we, we definitely have a lot of great programming. We love having Belinda on her Wine Wednesday segment. I feel like this is like a TV show. Um, <laughs> but she, yeah, she'll be back um, throughout May. We have great a great schedule in place, so we're super excited. And um, if anyone has any more questions, um, you know, we have a few minutes to answer those. These were great questions tonight, though. Yeah, thank and you. I love, I love this rosé recipe, so. Oh, I also forgot how much I like Chambord. It's really good. I haven't asked you on board in a really long time. Oh wait, Sarah has a question. Do you want to, do you aerate wine that's sparkling? You can. So people have told me, you know, Belinda, we love you, but we just don't agree with your love for champagne because we don't like sparkling wine. So oftentimes I'll turn to that person and say, but you really love Pinot Noir or you really love Chardonnay. So with the sparkling wines, if you pour them into a great glass, they will sort of expand and the bubbles will recede and you'll get a great glass of Pinot Noir Rosé or a great glass of Chardonnay. So decanting can be to eliminate bubbles. Decanting can also be to increase the oxygen level and sort of unfurl aromas and flavors. So big red wines definitely pretty invariably get better when you decant them. So if you love to drink, you know, big Merlots from Washington State and they always feel kind of a little tough at the first sip, those are wines that are definitely great candidates for decanting. So I've got all kinds of beautiful decanters and all kinds of pitchers that work great as decanters as well. You know, to use the Italy example as well, there are restaurants up in the Northeast in the Piedmont region, like where they make these great Barolos. Well, they'll actually ask you to order a bottle of Barolo a day in advance so that they can open the bottle, pour it into a decanter, and really let it get some air so that by the time you come to drink it at the restaurant, it's giving you everything. You know, it's giving you all the aromas and all the flavors and all the texture that it can. So I love to decant uh, for these big wines and to see how they change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brooke has another great question. What's the best rosé from Oregon? They're, are they oh. they're in the French style? 
there's so many. I mean, A to Z makes a really great one. My friends at Sokol Glosser make a really great one. Allison Sokol Glosser, like great, you know, lady boss who's following in her mother's footsteps. She's one of the originals. Erie, which is David Lett, which is one of the really first people to grow and understand that viticulture in the Willamette Valley is right and amazing and maybe even competes with what's going on in Burgundy and in a lot of France. They make a great dry style. I also really like, if you could find it, it's a tough one from Drouin. So Veronique Drouin is a part of the I think four centuries old Drouin family in Burgundy, France. She told her family, like, look, there's this thing going on in the new world, not just, you know, like the US of A, but there's also a cool place where you can grow Pinot Noir and make some great wine. So she was really brave and went to Oregon and planted. So they make some great rosé as well. And I love that in Oregon, they're so conscious about being local with what they eat, with what they drink. You know, there's all that great Pacific salmon and morel mushrooms. And, you know, right now we're going into spring. So there's fiddlehead ferns and ramps and all those things that are really delicious with rosé wines. So Oregon rosés with all this bounty that they have in Oregon right now would definitely be, gosh, I want to go now. I'm sorry. I know. I've never been. And I, it's, you know, you're making oh. me really get Portland. wanderlust right now. <laughs> Portland is so much fun. It's such a great food scene. Like Andy Ricker from Pock Pock is originally from Portland and they have great restaurateurs and bars, the whole, the whole thing and great wines, which is really fun. I mean, I love living in Chicago and we've got a couple wineries, but it's not the same. <laughs> we have a lot of breweries okay. though and a lot of distillers that are pretty great. We do have great distillers. Yeah, we <laughs> should, um, we should do that with you one day. I mean, we have, you know, Koval, CH, I mean, we carry a lot of those. Yeah. Brands. Illinois Sparkling Wine Company, they're pretty fantastic too. There are a lot I of great that one. Well, I'll have to go figure that out. Uh-huh. Field trip. Love it. And we'll everyone on a bus here. We're all going. <laughs> Well, Belinda, we are so grateful for you and the time that you can spend here with us. Um, again, you know, this is a very crucial time, but we're glad we can offer these events online and everyone's so great. And we love seeing uh, regular faces. We love seeing old familiar faces. Um, and thanks for everyone who's joining us from out of state because we're really happy that you're here too. Um, and we look forward to more events and uh, more sharing and you're welcome to, um, Contact me and Sarah. You can find me on Instagram at Amanda Puck. You can find Belinda. Belinda's at Belinda Chicago, right? Correct. Yes. Um, and Mariano's Market. You can just write us notes. We were, we'd be happy to see it. And I want to thank everyone and to Carol and Tanya and everyone who's been here. Uh, Carolyn, who's been like a repeat uh, guest. We love it. So thank you. And um, I guess we're going to sign off, but you can always get hold of us if you need us. <laughs> For your wine emergencies, we're here. <laughs> we're here. All wine emergencies. Any emergencies. <laughs> All right, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow, next week. Um, we can't wait. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>